I am so glad you guys all came out tonight. Thank you so much. I know the weather was a little scary and iffy, but we're here and I'm psyched. Um, I have to hold my notes because our printer died, so I just have a notebook as it goes. So what we're going to talk about today is covering your assets. It's your intellectual property and we're focusing on trademarks and why it's important in our community. A lot of people think that maybe smaller communities and smaller businesses don't need to do trademark protection, but it's vital and it's vital for the health of our community as a whole as well. So, oh no, there it goes. What we're going to talk about today, first I'm going to do a quick little introduction, kind of explain what trademarks are. So we're all on the same page there. Um, we'll go into dispelling some common misconceptions. I get a lot of questions in my practice and over the years I've seen very common ideas that come up over time and time again. And I thought we could kind of go through some of those. Um, if you see things that you have thought about or said, do not feel bad. Most people feel that way. So. <laughs> Uh, we're going to look at some trademarks in our daily lives, which really means what's going on in our community. And then there's a couple of examples of case studies. There's just two short ones. Um, and then some action items at the end that I'm going to put on you. Throughout this, I will be giving a lot of information. If you have questions, there's going to be a time after uh, dispelling misconceptions, which is going to be giving you a lot of information. If there's questions, please raise your hand and just let me know. My biggest goal is to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. That's, that's why I'm here. That's why I do this. So what are we talking about? Why do we all come out tonight? We want to talk about trademarks. We want to talk about uh, what they are. We want to understand why it's important, clarify the importance. But like, why listen to me? <laughs> Who am I even? I, as I was, um, as Nikki was saying, I have been a trademark attorney for, it's now going on 15 years. I have not updated that biography, but I have about 15 years of experience exclusively in trademark law. This is a very niche field that I have focused my entire career on. And essentially it's allowed me in my life to see the results of what I am doing. I used to be in middle management back when I was an engineer and I could never see the big picture of what we were trying to accomplish. And that really bothered me. But with trademarks, you can go out. You can see it. You can see how it's impacting daily lives within the community. I can see um, infringements happening that are harming my clients that I can help stop. And it really has an impact. Um, but more than all of that, I'm a member of this community. I'm a member of the Ashland community. I'm a member of the Rogue Valley community. I'm a member of all of the small communities that my clients are a part of. Um, that is one of the biggest things. I, being an active member of my community and helping grow the community, helping protect what the community has. So, moving on. What is a trademark? Let's get into it. So who knows what a trademark is? Do you guys have ideas of what trademarks are? Yes. Well, it's Different than a copyright. That is right. It is different than a copyright. And it is a, um, a logo or um, uh, perhaps a particular name that yes. you are trying to um, uh, land as yours. That is exactly right. A logo or a particular name that you're trying to land as yours. That's wonderful. Um, it's different than a copyright because I can tell you one of the misconceptions is that they're the same. Um, so the technical definition is any word, phrase, symbol, or design that distinguishes the source of the goods and services of one person from those of another. Essentially, the whole thing is separating yourself in business from somebody else so that there's no confusion. But as you said, some examples are company names. They can be used in this way. Product service names. So for example, Coca-Cola would be a company name, but it's also a product name. They also have Sprite as a product name. Those are all trademarks. Logos, so the images that come along with it. So for RVML, the Swirl logo um, is a wonderful trademark. Slogans, people with catchphrases that they use, those are also trademarks because it can identify who the company is, who's selling the products, who's selling the services. 
And then there's some other more interesting ones like shapes and colors. For example, as I was talking about with Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola bottle, that very distinctive shape, that is a trademark because you can look at it and it is Coca-Cola. You know the source, right? Uh, colors like UPS Brown is a trademark. Those are harder to get. Those we don't see as often and are not likely found in smaller communities. But I just wanted to point out that there's some, it, it can be anything that identifies the source of the product. But what's the point of trademarks? Why do we need this? Why do we need trademark protection? You have your trademark, what's the point of protecting it? Well, it's to protect reputations. The trademark is the thing, and the whole point is that it also holds reputation. As you have your trademark out there and you've put in marketing, business owners put in their marketing and build goodwill and reputation, that's all housed in the trademark. Maintaining it um, protects both the owner of the trademark as well as the consumer. So everybody is protected when a trademark is protected. And within the community, that means our community is stronger. When, they know, when consumers can come in and know that the goods they're getting are from the correct sources, not knockoff goods, everybody wins, right? So the owners, trademark protection um, is protecting the money investment, the monetary investment, the marketing, the blood, sweat, and tears, the labor of love at creating this brand. Um, a lot goes into creating a brand. A lot goes into getting people to know your brand. Um, and a lot goes into building your reputation behind that brand, which could turn on a dime if something's not done right, if some, somebody infringes. Trademark protection helps against that. On the other side, consumers, as I said, rely on a brand's reputation to make purchasing decisions. So, for example, um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, their O logo. I have two small children. If they made up their own play, which they do often, um, if they made up their own play and they decided to put it on in Lithia Park and they put that O logo on their signs around town, people might actually show up for that and then be thinking, what is OSF doing? This makes no sense whatsoever. And that can harm the reputation of Oregon Shakespeare Festival because my children are clearly not associated with them. Um, so that would be the consumers would be relying on it to their detriment. And the owners of the, of the trademark Oregon Shakespeare Festival would be harmed because my children's play would likely be terrible. <laughs> uh, it could be good, but. <laughs> so that's really the whole point of trademarks and trademark protection is to really protect the reputation of the businesses and within our community to protect the community as a whole because the community thrives when our trademarks are protected and our reputation is built better. So I want to get into now, maybe, some common misconceptions. And I got a bunch of these, so we're going to go through one at a time. And at the end, we can ask questions because I'm throwing a lot at you and I get that. So the first one, I need to actively trademark my brand. Now this is a pet peeve of mine. This is how most people, I need to trademark this. Well, a trademark is a thing. You already have a trademark. If you are using your logo, if you are using your brand name, and you put it out there, and you are selling stuff under this, you have a trademark. It's not federally protected yet. So what, you're what most people are saying is, I need a federal registration. Um, but it's automatic upon using it, which is really, really nice for a lot of smaller businesses that are like, OK, costs are really tough right now. Let me just get it out there. What's happening is, you are creating rights just by using the trademark in connection with your goods and services. You are selling something under this name to the public. They see the name and they can recognize that you are the seller. You have a trademark. You're building up what's called common law rights. Now, um, it's going to be harder. Well, I'll get into that in a second. We all, we all know businesses that have done this kind of thing. Um, been around for decades without getting federal registrations. And for example, in this area, there's Pronto Print. We know Pronto Print. They print up all of our business cards. They do all of our you know, marketing flyers. They print banners. They do graphic design. They do it all. They are not federally registered for their name. 
This does not mean people can go in and take Pronto Print and start using it in like Grants Pass. That's not, you know, or in California or wherever they've geographically gone. They've been using it for 50 years without getting this federal registration. They've built up significant common law rights. People know who they are. So essentially, why would you get a federal registration then, right? Well, you get the federal registration because it is a piece of paper that proves on its face that you are the owner and you have nationwide exclusivity. You can stop everybody else from using something similar um, in a similar field with that piece of paper. It is a lot easier to provide uh, or to prove that you are the proper owner of it in court if you get into a case, as opposed to coming up with copious amounts of evidence, which nobody wants to do. It's intense, and a lot of people just change their names. Um, it also helps others, it helps stop others from using the same mark. So in the case of Pronto Print, they're going to be pretty fine in this general area, but if they start expanding eastward, they may encounter some issues and have to limit a geographic to a geographic region. So there's ups and downs, but ultimately, you have a trademark the second you start using it and selling your products with that brand. What you want is the federal pr protection. Okay, this one I hear is, I changed one letter in my brand name from somebody else's, totally fine. For example, or I added a letter. If you wanna do Nike, N-I-K-E-Y, they're not gonna like that, right? So it is not a matter of whether you are identical to somebody. It has to do with the likelihood of confusion. And this standard is the reason you hire a trademark attorney. Because <laughs> it's confusing. The standard is based on what the recollection of the average consumer uh, would be for sight, sound, and connotation. So if you change one letter and it still sounds the same and has the same connotation, it is likely to cause confusion. If it is in the same field or a similar field, and you've just changed one letter, it's likely to cause confusion unless that letter changes the connotation entirely. So because of these legal nuances, it's usually best to hire an expert in the field when you're coming up with a new brand name um, that you've seen somebody else's and you're like, I'm not gonna infringe, I've changed one or two minor things. That's not always going to be the case. I have registered my business with the state so my brand is already protected. I've already done it. I've done my trademark protection. I registered my business name with the state. Unfortunately, registering your business name with the state, while it is essentially, it's necessary to get the formal designation with the state um, and there's regulatory formalities that are necessary, it's not actually gonna confer trademark rights to you. To, as I stated, the only way to get trademark rights is to be using the mark in connection with the goods and services. So selling it, making sales, um, providing your services to people. Getting the business name is a great start, but um, it doesn't confer trademark rights yet. You do not have trademarks. And then the, the state doesn't actually look through anything. You can go and change one letter from somebody else's name and they're like, ah, we don't care. So <laughs> it wouldn't stop those people from coming after you eventually. Um, the same is true with I got the domain name because domains uh, are essentially location references to a website. It's not providing goods and services to people yet. Now they can all be the same as your trademark, um, which most people do, and that's wonderful, but you won't have trademark rights, you won't be building trademark rights until you're actually making sales under that brand. Oh, this one hurts me. I'm a small business, no one would steal my name. Okay, so every unique trademark has the risk of somebody stealing it, especially in towns that rely on tourism because people are sneaky and they steal things, even if you don't think they're going to. Um, I have an example, I have a client who is a business consultant up in Vancouver, Washington. Um, amazing guy, offers graphic design services as part of it. Um, we've gone through the whole thing, and as we were going through his process, we found somebody right across the river in Portland 
using the exact same mark for graphic design services, who came about seven years after he started. He didn't know about them at the time. So we're having to talk, and he's like, wait a minute. That's not OK, right? What happened? You never know. You never know who's going to come up with the same name or who's going to take it. There's also the case of when Facebook changed their name to Meta. There's a small company in Arizona called Meta uh, that sells computers. They have a brick and mortar. They ship computers nationwide. And then Facebook said, we're just going to do this. We're going to steal your name. And they actually fought against them for a while. And I think they got a large sum of money out of it, <laughs> made Facebook buy it. But you never know who could possibly see it, think that's an amazing name, that's a beautiful logo, I'm going to take that home with me and build a business based on that. Um, yeah, people do sneaky things all the time. So just because you're a small business, especially being in a tourist town, you never know. Getting the protection is going to prevent you losing rights in the long run. So it's important. We got a few more. Trademark applications are easy to file. They are, they are not easy to file. I'm sorry. It is complex legal work. And if you file it wrong, you're out of luck. And we'll get into that one in a minute. <laughs> um, getting, again, if you have an attorney with you on your side, an expert attorney, you're 50% more likely to get that registration than if you're trying to do it by yourself. And if you do it by yourself and you're, you do something wrong, you've just lost that whole investment. So it's better to have an attorney give you the best protection possible the first time around. Make sure you're getting it done right. OK, my brand name, my trademark describes my business. And I will use my own as an example because I am guilty of this. Descriptions are great to get people to know what you're doing. My business is Halpert Trademark Law. You all know exactly what I do. My name is Halpert. I do trademark law, right? Would I be able to stop anybody else from using that? I can't stop anybody from using descriptive terms. It would be very hard for me if another helper wanted to start a law firm for trademark law. It'd be very difficult for me to stop them because it's descriptive. And the rule is that you're supposed to be allowed to use common terms in the language. You can't prevent other people from using those common terms. So selling apples and calling it apple would be problematic but apple for computers totally fine um, what you can do and this is good for smaller businesses especially in smaller communities is pair descriptive terms so i know um, catherine over there is for a dba has to use insurance and financial services with it would we know who we're getting insurance and financial services from if she used just that no, because that's incredibly descriptive. But if she pairs something really unique with it, then that unique part will build up the trademark rights. And she'd be able to you know, build her business and reputation and would really be able to go from there. So making sure something is more unique is fabulous for your trademark rights. Um, even if it's nonsensical, you get broader trademark rights going with something kind of out there. Um, Maybe not like pharmaceutical out there, but those are bizarre names. But further out there that doesn't tie in directly with what you're selling. Um, oh, it also sets you apart in the field. If you're doing something and you have a descriptive name, you're not set apart in the field, and then nobody can find you, and people want to find you. So I got a trademark registration. So this is once you've done a federal registration, and it says, I don't need to do anything else. Trademarks continue throughout however long you're using them. And this is another great reason to have an attorney, because if you are not actively monitoring, watching what the rest of the fields are doing, what everybody, all your competition is doing across the country, you could lose your trademark rights. You could implicitly be telling people, if you're not explicitly stopping them, you're implicitly telling them, go ahead and use my trademarks. And that's, I mean, and then you end up losing your rights. People will be like, eventually, you didn't stop me in X number of years. Clearly, you didn't have a problem with it. And the courts have gone along with this saying, yeah, you didn't have a problem with it. You should have stopped them. 
So this is something trademark attorneys offer is monitoring services afterwards to let you know so you don't have to stay up all night long, every night, looking on Google, because who wants to do that? But that is important. As long as you are using your trademark for your brand, you need to kind of keep an eye out to make sure no one else is using your trademark. How often do you need to check? How often do you need to check? That's a great question. Um, I usually check for my clients every, every month. I have a service that does every month checking. Um, and it's, it's usually a fairly quick, easy check. So like in, in real estate law, mm -hmm. you've got adverse possession. And it has a certain amount of time yes. to take action. Is it, are there so similar? that is, that is similar. Um, in, it's similar to real estate law and adverse possession. It is... It, it varies, but it, it's a certain number of years. If you don't take action within a certain number of years, the, they have a defense to say that you've lost your rights. The other side would have to prove it. Do you know what the number of years is? It varies from case to case. I've seen it as short as three. I've seen it as long as 10. Yeah. But it, it would vary from case to case because it's the law and you can find precedent for anything with it. <laughs> Especially these days. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so last one, which we had talked about, is trademarks, copyrights, and patents are pretty much all the same, which as you know, they are not. Uh, copyrights are gonna be your artistic expression, anything written down or put on tangible medium is what it's called. Photographs, uh, movies, um, digital uh, audio, all of that is going to be your copyright. It's the more artistic form. Patents are going to be your inventions. Um, I tried to get into patent law, but I hated it because the inventions are usually tiny little things that you don't get to see the results of anywhere. Uh, unlike trademarks, where you see brands as an onslaught all the time everywhere you go. And they have an impact, and you can feel the impact, which is what we're going to get into next. So are there, this was a lot of information. Are, is there, are there any questions on these? Sweet. All right. I, yes. Sorry. Absolutely. I, um, I'm still a bit confused about the description version like yours. Yes. So um, why can't you, why, so you cannot trademark your descriptive um, business name is what you're saying. I would not end up with very broad trademark rights. They would be very narrow and it would be just for this geographic region because the name I chose is so descriptive. Um, if I had done something more creative, um, it could have stopped people all over the place. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank okay, you. absolutely. Yes? If um, just using a mark allows you to start building common law rights in it. Why do people bother using that TM symbol? Oh, great question. He's asking about when you use the TM symbol. Um, if just using it, you're starting to build rights already, why bother using TM? The TM is giving notice. It is telling people, this is my trademark. And if you're giving notice to people, you have a better standing in court to stop others. You can say, no, I had TM on there. They knew this was a trademark and they used it anyways. Now, a TM is used, to follow up on that, a TM is used if you have not federally registered. You can use it at any time. You can put it on anything that you are deciding is your trademark. You can put that TM on there. R in a circle means federal registration. So that cannot be used until you have a federal registration, which then says, you definitive proof, I am the owner of this. Do we, people ever use the TM after they've gotten registered? Do people use TM after they get registered? Yes. Um, sometimes people don't feel like changing. Um, sometimes it just flows with whatever logo they have. The TM looks better. Um, you don't have to use any of the marking. You, it's essentially um, can be used and highly recommended to be used, but it's not mandatory. So. 
All right. Yes? So just go back. So in the case of your name, where it's too descriptive, can you put a TM? I can. So interesting things with descriptive marks. If it is not completely generic, like apple for apples, um, you can end up building up trademark rights over time. If I'm stopping all other helper trademark law, law firms, eventually people will recognize that that is just me. And you see it with like McDonald's. McDonald's was a name, right? He couldn't have stopped other McDonald's from hamburger places then. But over the years, they've built up enough rights that, you know, and stopped enough other people that they've gotten exclusivity. So I can put TM after Halpert trademark law. I could put it on my logo too, which would be better. But <laughs> so yes, you can eventually build up trademark rights in descriptive marks. Um, it's just a lot easier to start with something more suggestive or arbitrary. Mm -hmm. All right, great questions, thank you. So, trademarks in our daily lives. Who here likes coffee? Yeah. I love coffee, yeah. Um, do y'all have a favorite coffee house in town? I, I do, I absolutely do. No, everybody else is like, I love all the coffees. Wow, I'm actually very impressed because we have thriving coffee scene. I have my favorite, so I'll just talk about me because you guys are all great with anywhere. Um, I have my favorite spot. And I have intense coffee loyalty to my favorite spot. I see, I mean, this is just a, a small variety of the coffee shops that we have in Ashland alone. And then this is not even counting like Griffin Creek Coffee that doesn't have a store um, but sells its coffee all over, you know. So there's a lot of different coffees around here, a lot of local coffees. Um, when I see my favorite one, I immediately get that sense uh, I get the smell, I can, I can like taste the coffee, I get excited, I can picture the cozy atmosphere and the people who work there, the kind people, and I can picture like the regulars that are always there when I go and say hello, like I have all of this in my mind and that, that is purely from seeing their trademark. Is it Roco? It is Roco. <laughs> I was like, it's, it's purely from seeing the trademark. Um, that's the power of a trademark. I get all of that just from seeing that logo instantly. And actually, talking about descriptiveness, Rogue Valley Roasting Company is entirely descriptive. They're in the Rogue Valley and they roast coffee beans. That's what they do. But Roco is much more unique and can build much stronger trademark rights behind it. So tacking on to what we had been talking about a minute ago. Um, all these other ones I have my experiences with and I get those same kinds of feelings and I, you know, the reputation immediately comes to mind when I, when I think of these. And the other thing that happens is they all sell beans all over the place. I'm more likely to go to a restaurant that I know is selling my favorite coffee company's beans because I'm, I'm so loyal to them. Um, the reason it's important for the trademark protection, especially for these various different coffee companies in the region, is if I went down to California, we're so close to the California border here, and I saw one of them, if I saw, you know, Roco right across the border, I'd be super excited, thinking, oh my gosh, we're, we've expanded to California. This is the greatest coffee everywhere. And then if I tried it, and it was terrible, that could harm their reputation. I'd be like, what are they doing? What is this? This is awful. Only to find out that it wasn't them, it's somebody else who's using their name. And that would be problematic, and that harms Ashland. That harms the small communities for when people come in. Somebody might, from California might know the terrible coffee in California, come in, see a similar brand here that's been around longer, and not visit that company, you know, and that's going to harm our company. That's going to harm our company. That's going to harm our community. We want people to be able to come and enjoy their time in our community. So getting these protected nationwide so we don't end up 
in that situation is incredibly important. Okay. I have a couple of cases, one of which, so <laughs> I see Catherine laughing in the back. Um, two sisters writing and publishing. Uh, they are our dear friend Catherine Greenspan, who is in the back, and her sister Elizabeth Ann Atkins um, are, own this company. They are writers and publishers. Um, and they went through and went to get a trademark registration. They did it themselves. Uh, they spent about $1,000. And then the trademark office told them that they did it wrong. And they filed for the wrong goods and services. And they say, oh, OK, well, what are the right goods and services? And the trademark office goes, yeah, no, we, we're not going to help you with that. Too bad. You're out of luck. We're keeping your $1,000. That is a very good case of why, why you don't do it yourself. Um, they went through with an attorney um, and got a fabulous registration um, that gives the proper protection with the proper scope of everything um, that second time around, but there was no getting that initial investment back. The other case I want to talk about, now sadly, Standing Stone is no longer here. I'm very, very sad about that. Um, but Caldera, Standing Stone Brewing, originally, when they were going to open, was going to be Pilot Rock Brewing. Um, as you can see in their picture of Pilot Rock, they were going to be Pilot Rock Brewing. Caldera calls them up. Caldera owns a registration for Pilot Rock Porter. And they said, you absolutely cannot name your brewery Pilot Rock Brewing Company or Pilot Rock Restaurant. And they said but we're a restaurant. That's a beer. They said it's too similar because we both make beer, we both sell beer. People would think, coming in, that this is another location. It is a second um, location, or I guess at that time, third location for Caldera under a different name or that we are sponsoring it somehow. And Standing Stone eventually changed their name to Standing Stone instead. Um, they. Well, they are eventually, like, one is a beer, one is a restaurant, but there was that kind of overlap. They are sold in the same places. People would connect them. Um, that's showing how goods and services can be related as well. So you've got to watch out for that as well. If somebody is doing something in a different field, but it's related, then you can still have a problem. So those are the, the local cases that, that we had. And then taking action. I hope everybody will start looking around. As you go around town, just look at the trademarks we have here. As you're driving around, you can just pick them out. They're on every sign. Um, you can pick out and be like, there's a great logo. There's a great logo. Ooh, a slogan, you know? I want you to just start recognizing them. That's all I'm really asking for. If you see somebody and you know some owners and you're like, that's an amazing trademark, that's a great brand name, find out how they came up with it. People have. People have really great stories. If you are so inclined after that and say, is this protected? And they say, no, feel free to give them my name and number. I am more than happy to help them with that. But asking, finding out the development, getting those backstories on how people come up with their brand names is usually a very interesting conversation to have. Stephanie. Are you interested in hearing about local companies who are infringing? Yes. Oh, okay. I deal with all sorts of trademark stuff. Okay. I deal with helping people get their trademarks. I deal with the initial part of risk analysis to make sure you are not infringing on somebody else. And then I deal with after you get your registration, making sure nobody's infringing on you. So the whole life of the trademark is something that I handle at uh, Halbert Trademark Law. So that's what I had prepared for you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Stephanie. Um, so you talked about the TM symbol and you talked about the R symbol. Can you say a little about copyright? So copyright is a different form. Okay. And I focus entirely on trademarks. But I can say when you do copyright when, for artistic expression, um, the second you have put something down, it's like a trademark. The second that you start selling something with the brand, you're building up rights in your trademark. The second you put your artistic expression on a tangible medium, paper, digital file, photography, canvas, yeah. 
however it is, you have a copyright in it. Um, there are federal registrations for copyrights too, um, which is necessary if you end up having to take somebody to court, you have to have a federal registration first. Uh, it is an easier process than trademarks to get those. But they will take your money too if you don't do it right. They will. Mm -hmm. They will take your money if you don't do it right. The federal government is very happy to take your money and not give, and, and not give it back. That's <laughs> yes. Just an ex experience um, that illustrates the previous slide about other businesses. Yes. Uh, a few months ago I was working and visiting a small rural restaurant in southern Illinois. And the name of this little family-owned business was called Burger King. <gasps> in Mattoon, Illinois? I know this case! <laughs> anyway. This is my favorite case, the Burger King case. Yeah. Continue. No, you, you go ahead. You know all the details. Oh my gosh! Okay. <laughs> anyway, it, it was fun. And there were other Burger Kings in the community, <laughs> the ones we recognized, but it was mm -hmm. interesting the story on how that all came to be. Yeah, so this was a case, the Burger King case, in Mattoon, Illinois, was a case where there is a local family restaurant called Burger King. It came out before the giant fast food chain. Um, they got a state registration, um, and they didn't ever check on it. They didn't do anything with it. But eventually, they heard that the fast food restaurant was coming to Illinois. And they said, wait a minute. You can't come to Illinois. We're in Illinois. And the fast food restaurant says, we've been in Illinois. We have like 75 restaurants in Illinois and you didn't stop us. So it went to federal court and in court, what happened was the, the court ruled that the small family restaurant had priority, could stay where they were and use Burger King within a 20 mile radius. Ugh. That was the only place where they had priority, where they were there first and then the fast food chain could be everywhere else in the country. And they were limited to that place. Oh, that makes me so excited that you know that. <laughs> you had a burger there. Oh, was it good? Was it a good burger? Yeah, it was like a family restaurant. Nice. Okay. Are happy the, with that? The fries okay. weren't so good. No. Oh. But uh, what was really interesting was before they were Burger King, they were Dairy Queen. Oh, oh wow. They were, they were an ice cream place called Dairy Queen. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that was, that's one of my favorite cases that shows getting the federal registration is so important. And if you don't, you get limited to your geographic region. Or you, it's very likely you'll be limited to where people know you, right? As in you, you're kind of stuck and can't expand out further. Yes? It, it, on this, did they lose the case too in terms of the state because the other Burger King was already there? Is that the reason? Yes. Okay. So they lost there because the other Burger King was there and they didn't stop them. So there was state. Um, state regulations. And then I, I used to own a company in this area in, mm -hmm. on the coast, and the name of it was Cascade Herbal. And one time I got a call, and the people came over, and it was Cascade Botanicals. Mm -hmm. And when I dealt with them, uh, the, the quality of the material, actually I rejected, they wanted to sell me material, botanicals, and I, I it's not a pot company, okay? <laughs> It, and it had little pieces of the glue from the tarp. People use tarps and mm -hmm. collect and whatnot. So I rejected it, and I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen? These guys are going to go try and sell that, most likely. And it's got the same name, Cascade. So. Exactly. They, they had the same name. The quality of their product was not up to your standard. So you didn't want to work with them, but they still continued on with this. Did you end up... I Stopping so. them or? No, I, I thought about it, but I yeah. had too much on my plate, so. Oh, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Would, would, would I have been able to do anything? I actually thought about it and thought, well, it's, the name's too different. You know, botanicals so versus herb. But botanicals and herb would be considered. The same, right? They'd be considered very similar and more descriptive than Cascade. So Cascade would be the part that would have the trademark significance, most likely. Um, and with that being the same, you, if you started using it first, you would have a strong case to get them to stop. Yep. Yes? What about international markets? Mm -hmm. International, that's a good question about international markets. Um, trademark rights are only good in the country that you're in. 
So if you are going and working internationally and your brand expands out internationally, you have to get trademark registrations in each country. Now you can get, there's a lot of countries that work differently than the US. The US is a first to use system. So as I was saying, the second you are using it, if you're using it first, you have priority, you win. Regardless on whether or not you filed for a trademark registration yet. Uh, in a bunch of other countries, it's first to file regardless of whether you've used. So in countries like China, if you have put something on file there, you have priority, you win, even if you're not using the trademark. And then people have to come in and try to cancel and stuff. So it can be real tricky if you have large international um, portfolios, uh, but it takes, it's a whole overview of where you want the brand to be going and understanding and working with foreign associates to be able to get the best protection worldwide. But you do have to work country by country. Yeah, which is a bear. But. Great opportunity for um, entrepreneurs to find out what big businesses aren't in their region, mm -hmm. anticipate them moving into the region, registering the trademark. Especially in first to file and then, ones. Yeah. And then sell it to the company for what? Well, see, now that sounds like trademark trolls, and I don't know about what? that. <laughs> They're there for URLs and everything else. They are, and, and you can, really if you have a trademark registration and somebody, and there's a domain troll, I guess, um, you take them, you can take them to court and get them to give it up without paying. But yeah, a lot of times it's cheaper to pay these people off, unfortunately. Yeah. It's a business decision and budgeting, which is pain. Lee is going to cost this much if I just pay them. It's that much, yep. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I can't recommend you do that. Of course not. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <coughs> yes. So well, how much does it cost to file for a tra trademark? That's a great question. Um, the cost for filing. So I offer a package um, that does your clearance search. So you get a risk analysis of uh, essentially everything that could come at you, for the most part. Um, and how high risk it would be to move forward, how high risk it would be to continue just using your trademark as is, and everything that's out there, plus what arguments I would make if something came up. Um, and then there's the filing, that's also part of this package, and I go all the way through to registration. That package is the clearance search and registration package, because again, I didn't come up with exciting names. Um, <laughs> and that's a $2,000 package. Um, depending on what you are, what goods and services you file for, there's also the filing fees, and that's usually about two hundred fifty dollars per class. So, yes. As of twenty twenty three, subject to change. <laughs> this is going on YouTube. Oh, as of twenty twenty three, those are the the two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty dollars per <laughs> class. As of twenty twenty three. What's a class? That's a great question. Everything that you could sell products or services is divided at the Federal Trademark Office into 45 classes. So 45 chunks of different things. There's like 33 goods classes going with like beverages and alcoholic beverages and um, <coughs> toys and computer programs and all of that. And then um, there's the, the rest are service classes. Um, and it, it really depends on what you're filing for if you were doing something like merchandising, you'd end up usually in a lot of different classes because there's clothing. And then if you have like backpacks, that's a different class. And if you have like a bobblehead toy, that's a different class. So it could get expensive that way. And we usually end up trying to do your core goods and services first. Um, but that, does that answer your question? Yep. So it's really how they break it up. And that is worldwide, actually. So that's a worldwide system, the class system, that they do everywhere, except for Canada. Except for Canada. Who knows why? Um, yeah. I imagine, um, well, my, my question is, I guess, if I, I do have one trademark, but my attorney who did that way back, I don't know, in 2009 or something, passed away. And, oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, and so uh, and that was a long time ago too. So I mean, I just I've never really done anything with this. I've got the piece of paper. And that's kind of it. But I've never checked on a thing. I've okay. never 
you know, um, I mean, is that something you would take over? As yes, as, or, you know, I, am, I can absolutely take over registrations that's already been issued. There are maintenance deadlines at the trademark office mm. um, to maintain your registration. So the maintenance deadlines come up in the first 10 year period. A trademark lasts for 10 years. Oh. Um, and then. I don't know what year I did it, okay. It lasts for 10 years, and then you can renew it for another 10-year term as long as you're using it. Oh, okay. So um, as long as it's being used, you can have that registration forever, essentially, as long as you're doing that kind of thing. And then in terms of monitoring, that's a separate service um, that I offer as well on a monthly or yearly basis. Okay. And then the other question, I think you answered it in here, but just to be sure, yeah. um, my trademark was done before so this was done on a uh, a book that i wrote in a system there's a system mm -hmm. and um but it was the trademark was done before the book was actually published and so there's a the trademark has the word for f-o-u-r in there but i ultimately used the number four in mm -hmm. in that is that does that matter it sounds like it, it can so if you make yeah. changes to your trademark before um, a, re a renewal. Depending on the change, they could see it as a material alteration. Now, it sounds like in this case it, it likely wouldn't be. It's arguably not a big change, but they have, there have been cases where like putting in a hyphen they've seen as a problem. Mm. Um, the biggest thing is logos. If logos change and it's like slightly different orientation, they get upset. Um, but there's ways around it and we can we can talk about that okay. yeah yeah thanks yeah i offer free consultations so i'm happy to talk about anything with anybody about trademarks i'm pretty nerdy about it mm -hmm. yes does putting the tm after your uh, name really help or is it strictly who came first who came up first with the name it so it helps to give notice but if somebody sues you it is strictly who came first and proving who came first and then if it is likely to cause confusion. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what would you, what would the process look like if someone came to you unsure of what name they wanted to use? Maybe they have a few ideas already. Yes, if somebody comes and they have a few ideas, we can talk about the different ideas. I can talk about what would be the best options. Um, and then we would go forward with the clearance, the the trademark search and registration package, I would run one, their favorite one, we'd kind of rank them, run their favorite one to see if it is available, see if it's low risk. And if it's not, I always offer a second for free within that. I just want people to have the name and have it protected. Uh, beyond that, it's gonna be an additional cost to keep running clearance searches because each search requires a lot of time and effort and analysis, essentially. Um, but we would go through and we would rank them and figure out what's going to be best, what's going to be more, give more oomph in the industry, I guess. So, yes? If you uh, protect yourself in an in, in infringement and you bring the other party to court, I, I would be responsible for my expenses, right? If, if I were to win, the other party wouldn't pay my expenses? If you are in federal court and you win a case of infringement, excuse me, depending on the situation, you can get attorney's fees paid back. Um, if it is in at the trademark office, because the trademark office itself has their own administrative body, so it's like court light, essentially, um, you don't very often get attorney's fees back, but it's a cheaper, quicker process. Um, and for the most part, things just get settled well before that anyways. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I loved your questions. I loved having you here.